Anyway, um, the last chapter here is mobile payments. This is the hot thing. A lot of people think there's going to be a ton of money to be made here. And certainly, the American credit card system is a disgrace. It's been a national disgrace, like feet and inches, almost as long. We have these ridiculous credit cards where every single person that you run it through that thing going chunk, chunk, or you give them your number, they can just keep sucking money out of your account forever with no control at all on your side, which is nuts. And therefore, since we don't have any security on the client side, everybody, all the security is on the server side, and we've grown used to that. The server side hunts for suspicious transactions, and they keep the fraud rate down to half a percent by that. But for some reason, they decided to move us to chip and pin without pin, so it's chip only, which is not much more secure, but it did cause everybody to buy a new reader. But it is a little bit more secure in that people don't just have a number, they can't just keep sucking money over and over. Each number is used only once. So that's a little bit of help. But I think really the established infrastructure with payment, uh, with controls at the server side is what people are counting on. But anyway, a lot of people say we should just throw away all the credit cards and use your phone. And certainly your phone is a sophisticated enough computer to really do a good job of cryptographic storage and handling the information if you don't have other problems, but you're constantly putting apps on your phone. Like, like with all other aspects of security, I would much rather do it with an iPhone than an Android. And in either case, it certainly shouldn't be rooted or jailbroken because you're just asking for it if you turn off the security measures such as they are. Anyway, so here's the game. Everyone has mobile banking apps. The retailers of America seem convinced that everybody's going to pay for everything through their phone really soon and there'll be a flood of money coming in. Uh, customers are pretty leery of this. I mean, they have credit cards that are working and they don't really understand why they should all rush to put their credit card on their phone. Um, but the retailers think they can save money on it and, and deflect the credit card percentage because they take a few percent out of each transaction and deflect that over to somebody like the phone company. So they see money there. Anyway, so the point here is you put um, some kind of app on your phone that has stored your credit cards somewhere and it uses uh, NFC, usually, to send a signal into the reader. Um, it could also put a barcode on the screen that you scan, like the thing at Starbucks. And the Samsung actually can generate a varying magnetic field which simulates swiping a card through a MagStripe terminal, and that gives them the advantage that you can use it at retailers that have not done anything to prepare for this. If they're just ready for a swiped card, you can use your Samsung phone as if it was a swiped card. Yeah? I was going to say, Sam PL's project on MagSpoof uh, allows you to do that without a phone. Yeah, and I don't know what component in the phone has the ability to generate a varying magnetic field, but apparently there is one. There must be an electromagnet in your phone. Speaker? I guess. Maybe that's it. I don't know if the magnetic field is strong enough, but anyway, uh, apparently it can be done, at least with Samsung phones. Maybe they've added extra hardware for this purpose. Anyway, uh, then of course there's SMS and things that build just your phone company, like uh, in-app in purchases. That's another form of paying with your phone. But anyway, so you, you, have, you can uh, view your bank account balance and play with your money on your phone. A lot of people are doing this. Um, so they're typically web applications that you're viewing through a mobile browser. Or unfortunately, web view apps inside a native mobile app. And I think I showed you that last time. Uh, one of the vulnerabilities I found was some guy that did that. And then he found out that web view had a bug where certain certificates weren't getting validated. So he just turned off all validation for everything in his web view and said, there, I solved the problem. I'm not getting customer complaints anymore. And so when I told him, you're not validating HTTPS, he said, yeah, that's a feature. That's not a bug. And I took a while to argue with him about that. But um, so the back end components are, of course, the same as your desktop online banking. Your phone sends some kind of signal over the internet, like JSON requests or something. And that's the same as you probably do with a uh, web-based app. Um, but the special problem with the phone is the whole device might get stolen. And so you really ought not to be storing sensitive data on the phone in a place where it can be easily stolen. So Google Wallet started in 2011. They were the first people to really seriously want to put your credit card on the phone. <coughs> they had a plan for all this. You store your credit card number in the cloud. It's not on your phone at all. And every time you want to pay, um, you make a request to the cloud, and it gives you a one-time payment token that your um, app sends up. So you have to have an internet connection to make a payment, at least to some extent. And it was all very beautiful technically, and nobody cared. Essentially, nobody got it, and nobody used it. So ISIS, however, that 2% that of every transaction or whatever it is that's being consumed by credit cards is just too big a prize for anyone to ignore. So a Verizon, AT&T, Mobile created a contactless payment scheme and named it ISIS, which turned out to be a poor choice of names. Anyway, they struggled along for a while and Google bought them. 
which I guess they'll, they're just, you want them to get rid of them, or perhaps some of their technology is actually included in Android Pay, yeah? Yeah, they, slip, they split them off, so Wallet and Android Pay are different now. Like, you don't have your credit cards in Android Wallet anymore. That's just like a payment. Yeah, they pretty much they pretty much deprecated Wallet down to almost useless, just according to the articles I read. It's more like uh, PayPal and stuff now. Right, you but you can't, can't really make... Money between people, but you don't use your credit cards, where Pay is for the credit cards. That's so right. probably split. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, good. Anyway, so um, Google Wallet will now be prominently pre-installed on phones. And that's Google's new payment system, um, Android Pay, to replace Google Wallet. Google Wallet can no longer use NFC, so you can't use it for retail transactions at an ATM at a, a cash register, but you can use it, like he says, on the internet to move money around like PayPal. And this is integrated into the OS, uh, although I assume that's only for some Androids, because there are certainly some Androids that don't have Google Apps, because they've deviated too much. So. In principle, this could be more secure, I suppose. At least it's cryptographically more perfect than the old cards you just have a fixed number on them. Uh, but of course, there are a new set of risks. So here's the game in Apple Pay. Uh, the tokens are generated in the secure element, and that's the point of the thing. The secure element can store cryptographic keys and do cryptographic operations without ever exposing the key to the processor's address space. So no command the processor executes can steal the key, but it can send commands to the processor, please give me a one-time token calculated with that secret key that I can't see, and such things. So that's the game. And uh, if you don't have internet access, it has some degree of cash tokens. So you can do some number of transactions uh, without internet access, which will be synchronized later. Android Pay, you put the credit or debit card in there, and it requests a token. And once the token is issued, the card is now tokenized. It encrypts the newly tokenized card. So I'm not quite sure that I found a simple answer there to like the question, is your credit card number on the phone anywhere or not? Apparently with Apple Pay, it is not. And with Android Pay, it is, I think it's not on the phone either, but they don't make it as entirely crystal clear as I like to see. It kind of reminds me of the uh, LavaBit email application, the one Snowden used which then shut down, and the guy, the same guy that made it, opened a new encrypted email, and I watched the Ask Me Anything I Read It, where Moxie Marlinspike, one of the world's best cryptographers, asked him, do you have the key? And he had gobbledygook, gobbledygook, blah, blah, blah. He said, let's try again. Do you have the key? It was gobbledygook, we do this, we do that. No, why can't you understand this question? Do you have the key? <laughs> and uh, that's a really sensible question to ask. Is your credit card number on that phone or not? And it's not with Apple. And I think it's also not with Google. Anyway, so yeah. I just wanted to say that there, there's one interesting thing about the secure element is that it's in the NFC chip that is on the phone, but it is paired to the chip of the phone itself. So you, even if you wanted to, you just can't take another NFC chip and put it in, even from another phone, because right. they're paired. So Right, it's tied so, to the device. So even if you lose possession of your device, someone can replace it with a vulnerable or a different NFC chip. Yes, and that's the idea. If it's on the SE, even if someone takes your phone and messes with the hardware, they still can't get it. That's the idea. The only person that can get it is that Stanford group where they actually dissolved a TPM with acid and they ruined 100 of them, but they eventually found a way to stick a microscopic probe in and suck the key off of there. But it's, it's a heroic activity to get the key off of there. And that's the idea. A whole lot safer than that plastic credit card you've been carrying, <laughs> where if you lose that, anybody can just pick it up and <laughs> buy things with it. So anyway, um, Here's consumer payments. Uh, they like cash, they like credit cards, they like debit cards. They are very, very reluctant to try any of this new stuff like mobile payments is 1%. Uh, this is uh, how, people, how secure people think they are. And they, they're very suspicious of mobile payments. Probably more than is really justified, but um, you know, it's just complicated. They don't understand it. They're used to credit cards. I would think cash is probably your least secure method. <laughs> So Apple Pay, been on for a couple of years now with the iPhone 6. Uh, the customer payment information never goes to the retailer, which was PayPal's originally plan. You don't have to send your credit card number to a merchant you might not trust. You send them a token that's only good for one payment of so much money. And that's the point, a dynamic security code for each transaction. So Google was first, but nobody bothered to buy the hardware to take the payment. I must say, I know a retailer I visit frequently, and people would come in every week trying to sell him another gadget to take money out of some stupid app. There are a hundred of them, and the retailers really don't care because they're just trying to sell pancakes or something. And the fact that there are now 100 different incompatible gadgets they could buy for you to pay for your pancakes is not interesting. They just want to buy one thing and never worry about it again. <laughs> um, 
So chip and pin deadline was 2015, where the United States uh, liability was exchanged. So if your company continues to take mag stripes by swiping it, you can do that, but if it is a fraudulent transaction, the merchant has to pay for it. Um, the uh, credit card companies no longer accept the liability. They say it is your own fault for using mag stripes, which are not safe enough. You should be using chip and pin without pin. In Europe, you put in the chip, and then you type in a pin. So if someone steals your card, they can't uh, perform the transaction. But in America, for some strange reason, we don't bother with the pin. So it's turned into a single-factor authentication of what you have. Yeah? If you're doing an online purchase, what do you use instead of chip and pin? Is there some kind of a second verification as well? Uh, if you do an online transaction, there are those are card not present transactions, and those are the ones the hackers love. Because if you steal a million credit card numbers with SQL injection, those are the ones you can do. Um, sometimes they ask you for the CVV number on the back of the card, and MasterCard has some kind of online thing that tries to verify it that fails frequently. I often try to buy things and I can't use my card because it fails the stupid second attempt to authenticate through some kind of online system. But there are a large number of retailers, or a significant number anyway, that will take transactions without even the CVV. And that's what the bad guys count on. And of course, that is pretty foolish. But again, the, even with the CVV, all it is is what you have. If someone steals your card, they have the front and the back, and they're ready to go. The only point of it is if they steal a million cards out of a database, they can't do much with them without the CVV, which is the three or four digit number on the back. So then what's the point of chip and pin if you can just scan the number and take a picture of the CVV and then use the card anyway? Uh, the point of chip and pin is only at retail transactions that let you put in the chip. For online purchases, it doesn't do anything for you. We're still using the old system. But that's why people try to add other things, like uh, there's the, uh, the Google Wallet has the ability to be online transactions until it's PayPal. That's what's available for that. And PayPal is quite popular. So then there's Samsung Pay. This was their attempt to get here. It only is available on Samsung devices. It's uh, been out for about a year. And they claim that 90% of merchants will let you use it because unlike the other systems, the merchant does not have to buy a new gizmo to use it. They can just have their mag stripe swipe device, and this will create a magnetic signal that will simulate the card swiping through so the merchant doesn't have to bother, which that is pretty smart. So um, you, so here's the three, these are the three survivors, I'd say, of this mighty battle of the titans to see who is going to actually get you to use, put your credit card on your phone. Samsung Pay only if you buy Samsungs. You can have fingerprint or pin authentication, and it works with NFC, magnetic strike, or EMV. I forget what EMV is, electromagnetic something? Anyway, that's the, that's the thing where you stick it in, right? That's the modern chip and pin thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. MasterCard and Visa. Right. So anyway, that's the game. A lot of banks are in on it, and they claim 90% of merchants. Apple Pay, of course, only if you have an eye thing. And uh, you can turn it, you connect it to your fingerprint, but it's only going to work with NFC terminals, so only the trendier restaurants that have bothered to buy a new gadget just for this purpose can use it. Um, and Android Pay is essentially the same, but they don't have the fingerprint option. And you can do it with NFC, supposedly. And then, soon, they say, with in-app purchases, so you can do online purchases with it. Yeah? So, what's the chance that all these NFC readers are not compatible with each other? I haven't heard of that. I certainly know Bluetooth is far less compatible than it ought to be. Where my friend actually had to buy two sets of Bluetooth speakers, one for Android and one for iPhone. And I said, that's not possible. He said, yeah, you make it work. And I couldn't make it work. He's right. But so as far as I know, NFC is quite compatible because the whole point of it is to pay the retail outlet. And I haven't heard of people say, I have an NFC app and it doesn't work, but I don't know, anybody have any experience? Yeah. With NFC as a payment? Yeah, does it work? Uh, I've, I've seen it work. Yeah, but is it, does it fail often? Because I know one thing that totally, uh, one thing they had was they had the ability to put your boarding pass on your iPhone as an image and scan it at the airport, and for the first year it didn't work at all. The line was always backed up, and I say, what idiot didn't just print it on paper? And now that's finally started working after about a year. That was the screen brightness. Something what? Scanning a QR code. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It could be the green brightness. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so I don't know how about NFC. I don't know if, if NFC is like a pain and you're waiting behind the idiot trying to use his NFC. I haven't heard of that, but I've almost never seen anybody use it. The only people I've seen use it are like advanced technical experts. I think normal people just use plastic credit cards and have no idea why they should bother with any of this stuff. Well, They've got a serious uh, problem here. <laughs> like, what exactly is the benefit to them? There's a huge benefit to your phone carrier, and you know, they get 2% of every transaction instead of MasterCard getting it. 
but why do I care? And another thing is, if you use a real credit card, you get a lot of protection. You can complain and they will give you your money back, they will treat you like a king, because this is why they know that every one of those credit cards, on the average, means that they will make $2,000 a year in interest out of you. So they don't want you to get rid of that plastic credit card. They will treat you like a king. And I don't know if these online guys are in that boat yet. Yeah. I found the thing that talked about the uh, Samsung Pay. It yeah. It's like a, a picture of the uh, antenna. That oh, the antenna inside the phone? Oh, the mag? Your email. So it has, oh, so it has a special, it has a special, uh, special antenna. That's cool, it special antenna. From, uh, it comes from a company called Loop Pay. So they did add a special component to the Samsung phone to do that magnetism. They basically added an electromagnet to it. So we don't have to build one now. We can just modify a Samsung phone. You could. I remember this was one of the things in one of the movies, I think it was The Terminator, where the kid goes up to the ATM and he has a plastic oh, card yeah. and a computer and his coil on it, he slides it in and it simulates the magnetism for the card and out comes the money. And I went to DEF CON and the guy said, oh, I saw that movie and I said, wow, I got to build that thing. And he did, you know. So Samsung built it too. Well, I think it's Samsung 6, I think it's the first one. It's yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that's the game Samsung says. They don't store the credit card or the account number or anything on the device. Instead, everything is tokenized. So it's all stored in the cloud, and you just get a token. And if you use your pwn, you, you're protected because they won't have your fingerprint or your pin. So Samsung basically takes us up to the security of Europe, where they have chip and pin that they actually enforce. So it, this is why you know a lot. Of, it seems to me like they have a point saying if people put their credit card on their phone, they would probably be safer. But of course, then there's the issue of malware on the Android phone and such. Yeah. It also seems more convenient because. You can have multiple cards and you just tap and you choose which one you want. Otherwise, you have to go to your wallet and you have to find the right card and then use it and so on. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So it also, it's very easy. Like, you're, you don't have to cancel all your cards if you lose them. Whereas your phone, like if it's an iPhone, it's automatically effectively canceled when you lose it because you know, it gets locked out after 10 tries and all that. So it might be better in some ways. But I think it's just new and people are reluctant to have some new way to lose their money. <laughs> um, well, they were also integrating like loyalty cards and stuff too. So, like at Walgreens, yeah. you tapped it, it would take your loyalty card and then your pay card. But I would always forget my pen because I used yep. thing, I didn't reuse my pen, being security conscious. And, yeah. Yeah. So then you have to put in your pen. That's the only thing I didn't see where. Hey, you just write your pen on the back with a piece of masking tape. That'd be, that'd work. Yeah. yeah, that'll flip the phone over. Maybe here's the retailers. The retailers prefer Apple Pay. 36% uh, of them actually accept it, and 22% plan to accept it. PayPal is this is them in order of priority. So Samsung Pay is way down here, Android Pay is way down here. But the thing not reflected there is many retailers can accept Samsung Pay through the MagStripe, so they don't even know. They don't have to adapt to it. Like I said, retailers are one of the big bottlenecks. The customers don't see any reason to do this, and the retailers don't see any reason to do this. Um, then there's current C. See, here's people that got in the game. So Walmart and Target decided, why don't we get that 2% of the money? Why do we pay it to MasterCard and Visa? We'll issue our own currency system, like making your own money, and then we'll give people special discounts and stuff if they shop at our store with our brand of credit card money, and then we won't have to pay 2% to anybody. So they thought this would be awesome, um, but this one would um, give the merchants access to the data so they could target ads and such. It was designed for the merchants, and so here's the plan. It ties to your bank account directly, which is pretty disturbing because credit cards, you have a chance to dispute the transaction. You, it puts a barcode on your phone, which you scan, which then sucks the money out of your account. Um, all these retailers jumped in, being promised that they would like make a mint out of this. And uh, then also collected your health data by handing all your prescriptions and everything. Um, and all this goes back to the merchants. And then they all got hacked in 2014, and everything was stolen um, because it wasn't secure at all. The startup was hacked before they could even launch. The beta testers got hosed. And then they just gave up on the whole damn thing last year and just gave up. Nobody cared. I mean, you got to be kidding. We can't even get people to use Apple Pay, and you think you can somehow get people to use this junk. That didn't work. So it's been a like a dogfight with a whole bunch of animals fighting and one survivor coming out of it. Just a lot of weak candidates to try to get a share of that money. I wouldn't want to go up against Apple and Google. You know, I'd say, you know, I think I'll go into some other business. <laughs> anyway. Um, Square, of course, is a big hit. This one's hit because the cool thing about this is now normal people can take credit cards. That was the huge thing, it's like street merchants and stuff. It used to be only big businesses could. So, However, this thing was actually fantastically insecure when it first came out. Um, this is, in fact, just the um, commoditization of what Major Malfunction did at DEF CON like six years ago. I remember I came, I scared my department chair. I came back from DEF CON and I said, Major Malfunction did this. He took the um, 
Atabori from Yuri took the um, reed head from a cassette tape reader, taped it to a pen, stuck it in the audio port, and he'd go whoop across a credit card and get the strike and put it in there. Then he'd go whoop across his hotel room key and print it on there. And now his hotel room key has somebody else's credit card information on it and he can make purchases with it. And I said, that's awesome. And she said, you're going to teach students how to do that? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Just like you're teaching the pick locks and everything. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Anyway, so this just is a fancier professional version of the same thing. Your credit card is just a bunch of things that zoop. It's at audio frequencies when you swipe it through. And since you're manually swiping it, it doesn't really have to move at a constant speed or any exact speed. It just has to have the bits come in a certain order and within a very wide range of timing between them. So you just put this thing in the audio jack, swipe the card through, and the audio signal tells it what you've got. So it's all over the place, and this was real popular, um, but there are security problems with it. And we'll talk more about those later, but uh, the early versions of it didn't encrypt anything and could in fact be used as credit card skimmers, and you could just record the audio and play it back to make replay transactions and a whole bunch of things. They didn't seem to think about security at all, but the convenience was awesome, and these things got very popular. Which system was created by Verizon and then bought out? Good, looks like it's picking up the signals anyway. Now that must be soft card. It's the only one there that is a candidate for it. I'm buying it. All right, so um, I think a soft card is what ISIS turned into. All right, which one was hacked and died? switch to Android Pay, they had to ver re verify, like with my bank. They had me call like a department in my bank that then communicated with them in order to verify that they would allow the transactions to go. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, of course, when you're with, one of the, with one of the big banks, some of the credit unions, you have like a department to handle. Setting. Yeah, so it's not really working that smoothly yet. That's not too surprising. Well, it's, it's a protection mechanism, right? So it shows that they're doing something securely. And if you're with you know, one of the larger banks that's already in place. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And this is currency, of course. All right. Which one works at 90% of merchants, or so they say? Did you? Hmm. Grade that one? Yeah, I don't think you graded the last one. What's that? I don't think you graded the last one. I did. I was just sneaky about it. <laughs> I'll show you. I'm going to close this one at 30, and I'll go back and show you. Of course, everyone got it right, so it actually has no effect on the score the way this, is grade, this grading system works, but that's what you get for having grading on a curve, which I don't do for many things, but for this I do. All right, and that is Samsung Pay, supposedly, and if you look at the previous one, it's graded. So there. All right. So which one did Walmart develop? I'm pretty impressed with the security of Walmart's app, but this was not one of their bright moves. <laughs> Are the number one retailer in America, though. I'll quit well, at started three. a lot of different services and things that just don't seem to ever come to like completion. They get them to 80, 90 percent. Yeah. Like their streaming service. Well, they seem to make a lot of money. Anyway, that is current C. Walkit was some bizarre thing that let you have your credit card number stored in some kind of electronic device in the wallet without having to carry your credit card around. It was like an extra little gadget to carry around, not your phone. I think it's gone, too. Anyway, um, there are a lot of these goofy payment apps. Far more than there ought to be. All right, so it's this yeah, one. It to be bought by Apple or Google. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> why, why would you even consider anything but Apple and Google? You'd have to be nuts, except maybe that Samsung thing. Anyway, so then there's contactless smart card payments. The secure element is the core of this. Um, you can have an embedded secure element contained within the device, or you can have a SIM card which is a removable device that contains a secure element in it. And these things connect to the NFC and let the card talk to the near-field communication payment without the processor being involved, at least being completely under control of this. And that's the game here. Um, the idea is this will do cryptographic transactions and do cryptographic exchanges with the NFC reader, so it gives you a one-time payment code, and you don't want the normal processor doing that because it might possibly leak the secrets out by being hacked. Yeah? I'm confused by the early iPhones part. 
none of the iPhones before supported micro SD cards, so how would that work? None of the iPhones what? iPhones do not have micro SD card slots. Uh, yes, this was something you could add apparently. Like that was the idea. I don't know how you do that though. It's a good question. Um, Okay, I know iPhones are not generally user customizable. The idea here was to somehow be able to add this, and I don't know how. And you're the iPhone expert. If you figure out how, let me know. Uh, I was. So then there's all these cards use the Java card runtime environment, um, which is a way that there's an applet stored on the card, and there's an applet firewall on the card, supposedly, so each applet can't steal the data from the other apps, and it uses AES and RSA and all that jazz, and they meet the standards set up by this group called Global Platform. I should mention, by the way, especially considering what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks, all the apps I have tested use AES and sometimes RSA. They just do it stupidly so it doesn't do you any good. So this is not by any means a guarantee of quality. This is like saying I used a hammer and a screwdriver to build it. It must be a good product. I say, well, it could be or maybe not. So Global Platform sets the standards for these SE devices. And so here's the idea. Um, it has mutual authentication and it'll lock after a certain number of failed attempts, and only the owner can directly read or write to it, supposedly. Um, then it uses this PPSE, which is a registry of all the payment apps in the SE. This tells the payment terminal what apps are available. So when you connect to a server with HTTPS, you say, I want to make a secure connection. And the server says, I have these 25 ciphers. Do you like any of them? And you say, yes, I like this one. And if you have one that your client can handle, and one that the server offers, you, you agree on them and off you go. And this is why downgrade attacks work so well, because if the server hasn't updated their stuff, they actually have old insecure encryptions like export grade encryption back when America tried to block cryptography legally, and 40-bit encryption from the days of Windows 95. And if you lie to it and say, I'm Windows 95 running IE version 3, it will cheerfully downgrade to 40-bit encryption if the server administrator hasn't removed the old protocols. But it's a similar issue here. So you tell the payment app, payment terminal, what you got, and the payment terminal tells you if you speak some language in common, and then you can talk it. So the payment app on the SE card is what makes the contactless payment. And uh, these are things that run inside the SE. So it has cryptographic capabilities. So in principle, it can be doing a full RSA handshake with public and private key and all that stuff. And that can, in principle, be mathematically very strong. Another thing it can do is make a dynamic CVV, so it has a different code for each transaction. And it does this. This is controlled by application protocol data units, which are what is used to do it. So there is a command application protocol data unit that is really a simple little thing that tells you what kind of command, then there's an instruction and some parameters and length and all that jazz. It sends a request to for service. Um, if you have a large command, you can have multiple data units chained together to send more than 256 bytes. Um, and then you get a response, which is very simple, sort of like an ACK. The response data, and then just uh, status of the command, like the HTTP status code. Uh, 90 zero means it works. And so it's... Uh, a simple transaction, and we got a chart coming up. Yeah, there it is. So there, we'll go. So this this is how they talk back and forth between the devices with a whole series of these commands. So there's two ways to send it. The contact interface connects the SE to the phone itself. So the phone's processor and the apps on the phone can make requests to the SE, and the NFC radio lets the reader at the payment terminal make requests to the radio. So it can go both ways. Um, and so here's the game. The a uh, point-of-sale terminal sends a select to it. It then lists the available payment applets. The POS decides if we share some language in common and tells it which one we're going to use. Then it says the select command was processed. Then it sends a get processing options. Then it says what processing option it has. They make a deal about that. Then they compute a cryptographic checksum. And after they've agreed on some cryptographic protocol, then they perform the transaction. This is very much like the HTTPS handshake, which is seven steps. I want to talk HTTPS. Let's agree on it. Let's exchange a key. And off you go. Um, and that's how it looks. Ten transactions between the point of sale and the PPSE. And some of them actually go back inside the phone to the payment applet, um, which controls it. So that's the plan. And the whole point of all this is that the secrets are here, and you can't steal them from here. That's the point of it. So nobody can put any kind of malicious app on your phone, even if they jailbreak it or anything, that can suck the secrets out of the um, SE card. That's the idea.
So yeah. Just a quick question on that. So on the contactless uh, point of sale system, right there. Yeah. It's actually the terminal that's doing that. It's not talking to some backend server to get other some of this Oh, it could be. Sure. That's not. That's not what we're talking. It certainly could be. It could be. You could be getting it all from backend server or doing it locally. Uh, we're only concerned about what's inside the phone at this point. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't really know exactly what's done there, but I think they routinely do talk to backend systems. Oh, thank you. But in a way, they don't really have to because the usual reason they do is to check to see if you have the money. And I don't think that's an issue here, although maybe it would be. They're not, that's funny. When you run a credit card, they check to make sure you have the money. And I wonder if there's any point where they check here or if they can. I guess they can. But I, actually, that's a very interesting idea. Suppose you programmed this thing. Suppose you made a malicious one that would just... Tell it that, like, sure, I can make a token for $10,000. Another one, sure, I got plenty of money. I wonder if this thing would fall for it. I would imagine it's probably connecting to some back end. Well, the one, the one of the reasons why I'm wondering is that just I know that on the, on the phone side, you can cash a certain number of tokens. That's right. That's and I right. believe for certain uh, merchants, they do the same thing because right. they're using their phone to run their business with them, and then they upload this stuff later. And also, their internet might be out, and they don't want to lose the sales. Sure. But for that period of time, they can't verify things. And there were several big credit card attacks that relied on this. There was one that had caught people about four years ago where they got about 100 people worldwide to collaborate. They stole a whole bunch of credit card numbers. They printed a bunch of fake credit cards. Then they performed a denial of service attack on the telephone systems at the major banks. And then they went to the terminals and sucked out the money. And the normal system, which would have informed the central point that too much money is coming out of these accounts, was not usable. So they were able to suck a lot more money out of it. So it's clever. It is sweet. And you know, you wonder, what a, if the PPA, PPSE was lying, how smart would the mobile terminal be about figuring that out? And I don't know the answer. It's a good question. Yeah? Lying about what's the situation? For suppose it just kept letting me spend money without ever saying I ran out of money. That would be the simplest attack. Oh, but that information is coming from the bank. It be is it really? That's the question. So this, the, the, so this thing attached to the merchant is actually asking the bank if I have the money. It's not believing that I have the money because the phone says I do. But not always, apparently. Well, that's what I wonder. It would be, that's an interesting point of weakness. And certainly, if you take down the phone network, then they can't do that so much anymore. And that's, you could just, but if you don't, it would be a question, how is it? This is an, another issue with Bitcoin. One thing about Bitcoin is if you spend Bitcoins, those transactions are not final until they've been mined, and they're not considered irrevocable until six more blocks have been piled on top of them. So even when everything works perfectly, it takes one hour before that transaction is irreversible. And now, because we've hit the limit of the block size, it often takes more, like two or three hours. So you could totally spend your money multiple times. Spend the same Bitcoin at multiple people, and they wouldn't notice until an hour later after you drove off with your car. So. It's, that's why in a lot of ways, Bitcoin is not really appropriate for retail transactions. It's a whole lot more logical for like interbank transfers of money or something. Anyway, um, if they, they call that float in the world of checking. That was the old one. You'd write a check account and it'll be a while before the bank notices you overspent spent your money. So you keep writing more checks. And there were people that would even just keep them going around in a circle, pay off one credit card with another, pay off that with another. And you, if you, each one of them takes like a week to figure it out. So you can like go on for months this way. <laughs> That's how you build your credit. That's kiting, yeah. Same thing. 10 grand to make it into like 100 to build your credit. And yeah, even, that was a big thing in the yeah even a sm and on a computer, even a small time delay can be enough to get away with murder. You make a system where it, uh, so you spend your money and it's going to take them five minutes to figure out that you haven't spent the money. You just need to make online transactions or, you know, it, it, that's, you could exploit that in various ways. Anyway, so the secure element has an API. Only the Google wallet can use it on Android. Um, and this requires system level permissions. And the apps have to have a certain signature here um, to run. And the only signature in that file is Google Wallet. So only Google and only their Google Wallet app is allowed to use the SE card. That's the plan. So the API is very basic. It just allows your application to open a channel with the SE and send these APDUs. Um, so it works for embedded SEs, but not for these other kinds. They're used in some phones. If you want to run other kinds, you need to add this open source kit called the Secure Element Evaluation Kit. But supposedly, you're still secure because the cryptography secrets on the SE are not in the address space of the processor and the processor can't steal them. All the processor can do is send these APDUs requesting the chip to please do something. I'm pretty sure they changed that with six. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. And the other thing is, um, this is all directly modeled after the 
uh, trusted computing platform and the coprocessor in, um, in desktop PCs, which was put there to meet military requirements and named after the Navy military requirements from the Orange Book. Um, so it uses a whitelist available here listing what, what signatures allowed to get in. It matches the global payment system and it has a thing called the Access Control Enforcer, which makes sure that the signature of the application matches the storage signature to make sure the app hasn't been modified. Very much like the boot up control in Windows uh, in the new system replacing BIOS. So consumers see the mobile app, it pops up some kind of menu, it offers you the card you store, you choose which card you want to put in. Google Wallet makes you put in a four digit PIN, although I, th um, and I think Apple makes you put in a thumbprint. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're both expanding for more choices. And so the idea is it's a whole lot more secure than your normal credit card. If all this stuff is actually working as intended. I think customers are suspicious because they correctly realize that they have absolutely no idea what's going on in the phone and no way to check it. And I must say, uh, from what I study of mobile apps, they are right to be suspicious that what's going on behind that curtain is probably something gruesome that I wouldn't approve of if I understood it. Anyway, another batch of iClickers. So which one is also called a SIM card? Hmm. I'm going to have to flip back. I think I remember. I'll quit at 25. Looks like the answers are in. I think it's the UICC. That's pretty popular. Let me just flip back and make sure I'm not lying to you. Um, There, UICC is the SIM card. All right, good. Which one supposedly allowed early iPhones to use NFC? I don't know how it worked. Maybe plug in the audio jack? It's hard to say. <laughs> 30 pin connector did a lot of stuff. What's that? The 30 pin connector on the bottom did a lot of stuff. Back there was a 30 pin connector? Oh, there was, yeah. Pieces that would slip on. And oh, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Maybe you just plug into that thing. That makes sense. Imagine. But you're right. That 30 pin thing at the bottom would be the way to do it. But it would be interesting to know what they really used. Anyway, that was supposedly the micro SD. You could somehow connect this card and add functionality to your iPhone. All right, which one's a unique number for each transaction? All right, and that's the DCVV. The CVV is the three or four digit number on the back of your card, and the Z is the dynamic CVV, generated for each transaction. What's the app on the SC with a list of signatures? Seems to be only one logical answer. All right, I think it's the application access control enforcer. You guys think it's the SE API? Let me flip back and see. It's the access, wait, that's what enforces it. I'm wrong. It's, um, yeah, this is it. The Seek uses global payment. Oh, now global payment, I'm confusing with the standards, which had a similar but different name, I think. That's what's getting me. I don't know about you guys. But there was this global platform and global payment are different. There, that's what got me. Global platform is just standards. Global payment is the thing that has a list of signatures. Which I, I had... This information in, was conveyed well enough to, to count this question. Well, <laughs> I'm aware of that, but I can't get it straight either. <laughs> but you people have to suffer. That's just the nature of the, uh, the system. Well, one of us is this is like making you... Uh, Learn Latin. Anyway, so, however, <laughs> although you have to suffer cruel abuse, you do get a 10-minute break. We'll pick up at 7.05. Anyway, good. So let's pick up here. So, Google Wallet had some amusing vulnerabilities. Um, one of them was this one. The pin is stored. Okay, you only get six tries, but you can steal the hashed pin. Like, you can steal the hashed passwords off of something. And the pin only has 10,000 possibilities. So it is not difficult at all to brute force them all. So if you steal the file, you get the salted hash and you can just crack it. Um, this is how padding oracle attacks work. Padding oracle attacks work by if you have a block of, say, eight bytes that get encrypted, you 
put in one byte and you have seven bytes of filler and there really are only 256 possible plain texts. So it's not hard to brute force them all and find out what's going on, even if the encryption is strong. Anyway, so Steve Rubin, this guy named Steve Rubin, somebody, Rubin, not Steve Rubin, um, but he found this thing and he said Google was very friendly and they thought the only way to do this would be to move the verification onto the SE so the pin hash is no longer stored in the address space of the processor and uh, that would be good, but they apparently can't do this legally because apparently if they put these hashed passwords on the SE, the banks would be liable for breaches. But if it's on the phone, then it's the app that's at failed and the bank is not liable for the app. So that was what they said. The lawyers prevented them from implementing this technical change to dodge the liability. I, yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> then how does Apple do it? Uh, I don't know. I, I know everyone ducks behind liability. I know there was a case about six years ago where a bank required everyone to use an old version of Adobe PDF Reader to access their website. And somebody did that and got hacked and they stole their password and lost $200,000 as a business and the bank refused to pay on the grounds that it's your problem and they won in court. So it is a funny little dance here as to whose fault is it actually when you get hacked. And I think each one of them has an army of lawyers to make sure that it's not their fault when you get hacked. Um, of course, in a if there was not, this is all the tragedy of the commons, where people can just blame it on someone else. In principle, if you put it on the SE card, it wouldn't get hacked, and there wouldn't be a problem, but, you know, there would be an increased liability for the bank, so they have no incentive to do it that way. That's the statement here, and this certainly appears to be the case. The, um, all the apps I'm examining do terrible things, and they correctly believe that their customer can't tell, so no one's going to punish them for doing it the wrong way. Um, so the pin storage was just like your Android or your uh, Mac password storage. It salted it with a 64-bit salt, then it hashed it with SHA-256. Now, uh, modern machines use 5,000 rounds of SHA-512, but it doesn't even matter when you only have 10,000 possible passwords. You can try them all. So you just try all of them and find out which one of them creates that hash, and you, you're on the business. Um, the hash was stored in a SQLite database in the data, data, com, Google, Android folder where you could just find it, and Wallet Cracker was an app that would do this for you. Try all 10,000 four-digit pins to find the pin from the hash. Um, I'm not sure if that ran on the phone or on a PC. I think it ran on a PC after you steal this, but anyway, that's the game. So Google said, don't run Google Wallet on rooted phones, which I must say is pretty good advice, actually, although it's not very reassuring because the, the thief can root your phone after stealing it. So it would be much better to move this onto the PE. Rooting and also, phone, though, you have to wipe out the, all the data on the phone to root. You do? I think so. I don't think with the early root exploits you did. No. Um, well, if, you have to unlock the, if you unlock the bootloader, it wipes the phone. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah. I know. There were some exploits at some, at some times that would root Androids without having you lose data. Huh. I don't know no. if they work on modern versions, though. Yeah. Modern versions get safer. Um, anyway, so here's countermeasures. Don't root your device. Enable a lock screen so that if the thief steals it, they can't get in to root it or anything. Uh, turn off ADB debugging and put on your patches. You know, if you keep everything up to date, there's less chance that there's a convenient root exploit for them. Uh, and then there's relay attacks. I don't know if this has ever really been done in practice, but it is the kind of thing worth considering. So here's the game. Uh, I get some, I put malware on somebody's phone. Then they're waiting in line at Subway, near a mobile contactless reader, and I'm over at Sears trying to buy something, so I get their phone to pay for it. I get their phone to send the NFC stuff, and I replay it here. So it appears to this point of sale system as if they are paying for the device, for the product. And uh, this is the kind of thing that you block with a uh, trusted third party in HTTPS. But the point is, their conversation with this reader could just as well be the conversation with this reader and you replay it all. That's the plan. Um, you take the APDUs, which are moving from the NFC reader to the point of sale system, to the phone, and you move them over TCP to remote location and replay them. Yeah? It's an app called NFC Proxy that does that, and I played around with it with uh, BART tickets, or did BART um, Clipper cards. Yeah, did you get it to work? No. OK. That is pretty awesome. I'd like to see this go. I mean, it that's certainly is. That's the app. It's a clever trick. I don't know how practical it is in practice, but it's a clever trick. I think 
The one thing that, the simplest defense against this is that NFC really is N. You have to be near. You have to be like within a few inches of the reader. So you can't just casually do this to somebody. I think uh, it's a kind of artificial attack in that regard, but it certainly is nice to imagine you could prevent it. So um, one limitation is you'd have to have their mobile payment app unlocked, because remember when you make a payment you have to swipe your thumbprint, so they'd have to actually be paying for something at the other end, and Google Wallet requires the entry of a PIN. So it would be pretty impractical to do in realistic terms. But you certainly, it's a theoretical attack and you might want to consider having some defense against it. And you can relay through a malicious app, works against Google Wallet, um, and this is the game you can bypass things and uh, steal the signals here and send them off through the network APU somewhere else. And it technically is possible inside the phone, but I think there are other layers of defense, like the fact that you have to have a pin and such that make this uh, less likely to work. Uh, so your contactless POS terminals should have a timeout so you don't stay connected for a long time. Um, and you can use location information. That's a good trick. You know, they're always looking for suspicious transactions, and here, they could notice that the GPS tells me that I'm not actually in this store. So I shouldn't be accepting that transaction. And that's a pretty good one. So then there's Square. Like I said, Square, when it first came out, was a big hit. Everybody I knew was using it, and nobody checked the security for a while. And when they did, it was actually very insecure. Um, it took, they made 2.75% of every transaction coming in. Um, and uh, the, the new Square is out that can do mag stripes or the chip and pin. Um, it, it looks like it's not much bigger than the old Square. Uh, but the original Square was just a magnetic read-write head going straight in the audio jack with no encryption anywhere, so you could just totally use it as a skimmer to make an authorized copy of credit cards. And a Verifone, who is a competing company, decided to release an app that would turn your Square into a skimmer and you could steal credit cards with it to try to show how bad it was, and you could then record the audio and replay the audio and use it to make more credit card transactions because it didn't have any layer of encryption at all. Um, and if, if you had a software attack against the reader, you could be stealing credit cards that are swiped through it and all that jazz. So Square modified their app to encrypt it. They didn't explain exactly what kind of encryption they're using or anything, but they did encrypt it so that it's different every time, and if you record it, you can't replay it. And that pretty much uh, ended that obvious uh, attack. So nobody thought of it, but... Like I say, they did um, figure out how to do it. All right, so um, you can use the Square app to perform mass fraud. Instead of manufacturing fake cards, you could just send the signals to Square and make transactions through it. So Square's encryption now prevents this, and the author tried it and saw that the encrypted audio stream cannot be replayed. It includes some kind of random notch that prevents replay, which is not that difficult to do, but they just didn't bother in the first version. Most people don't think about security at all, I've recommended this to students. I've had students come to me with a really foolish idea that it starts some company that's not going to work. They say, what do I need to do to secure it? And I say, don't worry about that until you really have cash coming in. Once you have cash coming in, now you have assets, then worry about security. Your first job, though, is to make something that someone actually wants to pay money for. <laughs> anyway, um, so there's the last batch of eye clickers. So which one did Google Wallet Cracker expose? Good Lord. So that was uh, pin storage. Cached, but stored where it can be stolen, so it kind of undoes the whole point. All right, which one do you stop by encrypting the audio stream? It's going to happen again, that loopy thing. All right, that's skimming. All right. Which one? It's also called chip and pin. EMV. All right. So let me just see who got the most right. 
And that's pretty much it. There won't be any more lectures in this class, I think. I'll just be in the lab to help people who want help. But there are like two more class meetings, and I don't think I want to add more material.